Uh, hi everybody, my name is Maurice Mugisha. I'm a filmmaker, director, and a photographer as well. Sometimes I try acting as well. And I'm a student of uh, performing arts. I have a bachelor's in cinematography from Macquarie University and a bit of a diploma in radio and TV production. Opportunities are here. Why not? Some of the fundamentals uh, and of how to become a good director, uh, what can I say? Just look around yourself. Most of all, you must have a foundation of film, or at least you should have got it from a friend, or you should have had an experience, or you should have watched a film, and you actually think film, film. Uh, you should have, you know, uh, so many other things that, you know, in circle art, well, I'll give you a live example myself. Uh, before I became a film director, I used to write. I used to write a lot. Then I used to watch a lot of films for study. Yeah, one of the films that I watched was for uh, a dedicated filmmaker. Uh, a film was called Camp Fiore. I think it was a film about you know, those ex-servicemen who went to fight. Then they were supposed to come back home. Yeah, that's during the World War. So that's more like a study film. And you have to feel it inside that you actually want to be a filmmaker. You just can't jump from nowhere and say you, you want to become a filmmaker, even if you have all the money. So basically, as a director, you must have a push, like an individual push. You must push yourself to want to want film. Take for example, living in an environment like Uganda, it's very tough. You know that. It's a tough, it's a tough field to actually exist in a climate like Uganda. For those who are into film know what I mean. So you must have the drive. It's not just about the money or the resources. You must have the drive. Then second of all, you must understand the tenets of film of, of filmmaking. I'm, I my personally am I'm a student of film. Then I grew up in an environment where I, I watch a lot of cameras. I watch a lot of films. Then I'm also passionate basically about film. If you, I'll use an acronym and say, if you cut my, my, my skin, <laughs> that's all you will see. You get the point. Yeah, just as much as another person cares about fish and fishing, they worry about owning a boat and a net. Then I worry about the camera that I'll use, or I worry about the cast and crew, or I worry about the proper cast. You get the point. Then also you must have a sense of teamwork for you to be able to thrive, because at the end of the day, it's not just the director who, who makes the magic. There's the, 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 there's the cinematographer, there's the director of photography, there's the, the, the small guy down there, the best boy, he's not even small. There's the welfare manager, then there's, uh, name it, there's the producer, there's the, the, the guy who does the lighting called the gaffer. So you must have that relationship. You must, have, you must know the value of having a team or running a team. If you don't know that, then I am very worried. Then also to talk about my, my directing. Some of the things that drew me to directing was the fact that I always had a dream, like a big dream of creating images, images that influence society. So if you notice, if you ever get a chance and watch my films, you'll notice that I make films to touch lives. And that's also one of the reasons why I make film, because deep down in my heart, I feel that the more I make more films, the more I touch hearts or change lives or alter perceptions. One of the most important things is that the director must ensure that there is a healthy relationship and collaboration with the other members on, on, the, on, on the set. Why do I say so? It's simply because a director makes sure, the director is like a, is like a, a, a father on set. If he, imagine a situation where uh, probably the makeup artist has a bad day or the makeup artist is missing, maybe her makeup kit, and probably maybe the actor or the lead actor has issues with their health. Let's say they have flu or a terrible cough. It's the, the role of the director to make certain that they are aware of the health or the condition or the situation or the feelings of the, of the people on the crew. Because this way, if you do not make sure that you know 
everything that is happening on set, then definitely you, we're going to have a problem with the production. And this will end up either you're, co you, 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 you're, you're going through a lot of costs. For example, if you have, uh, you're shooting for, let's say, 27 days, you'll have to end up shooting for more than those days which have not been budgeted for. Then also, it's important to notice that if a director has a core relationship or a working relationship or creates a safe haven for all the performers on set, then definitely we're going to have a brilliant shot or a brilliant film or a brilliant short film or a brilliant production. So naturally, the onus is on the director to actually create a very comfortable environment for the entire production. Basically, as an emerging film director from Africa, I have had a couple of experiences or experiences that have actually influenced my works of art. Uh, I will tell you that growing up, my past, where I grew up, I'm a guy raised from a barracks, a military barracks. So I grew up seeing all these things. So I, I have so many innuendos, situations, uh, experiences that I've seen growing up as a child. So it's not just that now that I'm grown up into a director that I've just started to pick up things. Usually these things move with you. And what am I saying? That has influenced some of my films uh, that, I've tried, that I've made uh, and how. I have learned to look at life just the way it is. You get what you see is what you get. You get it, life is not full of color. Life is black and white. You get the point. So basically for me, uh, reality or the society where I'm born from has actually experienced so much of my creativity. Then also, of course, watching other people's works. I have watched uh, some films. One of my best films that have influenced me, one of them is called The Mother. Uh, I don't know if you've watched, it's more like, um, more like a thriller-like kind of film. Then I have watched, I gave an example of Equalizer, uh, the director, Antoine Fuqua. Basically, those films are dear to me. They have actually moved me in such a way that I have mastered a few things like cinematography, uh, the performance, let's say from Denzel Washington, you can tell he's a black man above 50 and it's amazing how he does his moves and how he throws his lines out there like he is not prepared, like he drops it onto you. Like I watch these films as a, as a viewer, but then also it impacts me so heavy on, heavily on me as a director. So it actually improves my works. I'll give you an example of Tembele, a scene where where I have learned, if you notice Tembele, it's more of an emotional film, an emotional drama than it is of an action packed film. So basically I've learned to, to extract emotions or to treat emotions behind camera and make sure that my character gives me 100% of what they're supposed to do in the script. Then also another um, um, uh, influence I have gotten is the festivals that I've, I've been lucky to move. I've moved to uh, Africa Mashariki Film Festival. I've moved to the Amas where I've rubbed shoulders with the big boys in the game in Nigeria. Then I've um, rubbed shoulders with people in the Vudi Afrik festivals where we have met other directors and we've had tete -a tetes and small talks over cups of tea to learn new things on how they actually manage to you know, push their agendas in film as directors. So also learning from people or fellow directors who have been there before you and being open-minded also has greatly impacted on my filming style. Some of the techniques that I've always moved with under my belt to make sure that we have like a proper production, uh, these. One, I have learned to be free-spirited. I've learned to have a free mind and I've learned to have a working relationship with the actors. If you met your lead character and the other characters or cast, it's very important that you sit with them and understand, you know, you get to know who they are, you get to know their weaknesses that way they let you in into their lives as performers. As much as in performing or performance or acting or in film, they tell the character to be free. Sometimes they hide 
who they really are. So as a director, you become like a personal person with them. So when you set a camera in front of a, of, of a, of a character and they really have a problem, however small, you get the point, they'll be so free with you to be able to share. Then also, sometimes we get, especially here in Uganda, when we actually shooting scene per scene, scene per scene, you notice that these characters are being overexploited mentally, psychologically, or physically drained. So what do you do? Sometimes we have to pause a shoot, take for example, and ask an actor, what do you feel like? What do you want? Like, you want to take some sugars, maybe drop them a mango juice, like small things like that. You want to lick a sweet, you want to take a one minute walk and come back and think about it and rethink yourself, rethink the role. So that is very important as a director to be able to let go, not to always just push, push, push hard because usually that presses the character against the wall and they lose themselves at the end of the day. Then also, I've always tried to create free space, like free space that so much that your actor is uh, approachable or your actor can approach you as a director. Take for example, if a character doesn't understand the script or a certain part of a script, it's very simple. The character will walk up to you. So you have to create that room and space for a character to talk to you. Just the way I told you earlier that if they have a problem, of course, they're not going to ask you to buy them a jet or anything like that. But things as simple as telling them, you know what, I don't understand this role. Or can I throw, can I drop this line in my mother tongue? Here we do, we do, we do I do a lot of indigenous film. So sometimes you write them in English, then you have to change them into vernacular. So you have to give them that, that free space, that play area. You get freedom to express themselves. If they don't feel comfortable in a costume, they ha you have to create that free space for them to actually let you or drop their secrets out with you. And you know, they have to feel safe as well. Because remember, actors are the vehicles that drive the film home. It's very important as a director to create like an approachable environment between the entire thread of production. Why do I say so? It's because at the end of the day, the director is not the only person that makes the film a film. Like I told you, from the smallest guy who is a best boy or a set runner or a guy who fixes the, the, the generator, as you know, we have problems of power out here, power surges or even if it's the driver, or the guy who run, who a grips guy, who knows where the spanner is. It's very, very important to have a working relationship with those people. How? Before even the production begins, you must make it clear to the team, because we usually have these meetings, the production meetings, actually minus the, the cast. Now I'm talking crew now. It's very important to have that proper relationship because at the end of the day, it's that small guy in the corner that is almost invisible that makes the magic. Why? It's simply because everyone on set or the production team contributes 100% to the building of the film. So it's important to have a healthy relationship. Then getting away from the crew, let's imagine um, the makeup artist doesn't turn up because either she has a bad stomach or she's had issues with a person who is paying or so imagine if you don't have a working relationship with a makeup artist how are you going to roll you're going to have a problem with the dop rolling the camera then you're also going to have a problem with the director rolling so it's usually the role or the job of the director to make sure that all these fragments in the particular uh, pro t uh, film you're producing are stuck together like a bundle. Then also, I must let you know that it's not just about in the starts of production or pre-production. Sometimes the director, not even sometimes, the director has to go fully and follow up on post. That is the editor. The editor who usually does the cuts, then to the very end, of the colorist, where the colorist is, let's imagine the colorist is the last guy the, at the chain of production. It's important that the director sits with the editor to understand 
which particular chops or cuts follow which and why because he's been there from the start then also it's important to maintain a smooth relationship with every one of the people on set because if you don't do so you will notice that there is a gap in the chain of production which will render your project null and void As a director on my last set, which was Tembele, we faced a couple of challenges. Like, you know, the challenges never really end, you know. Um, first of all, we had a problem of budget. So <laughs> I'm sure everyone, everyone who has made film knows that there's never enough budget for, for you know, upcoming filmmakers. Because half the time, you draw money from your own pocket. That's like a personal experience. And for most of the movies, if, if, if I can say, all the movies that I've managed to produce have been usually from my pocket. Like I haven't had an exec coming on the team and telling me, hey, look here, let's partner and do this to save me from that. But, you know, here we are. Uh, I'm still producing. So with budget, you usually find that uh, you cannot pay your cast enough money, or at least enough. There's never enough, but enough money to make them feel comfortable and, you know, shoot you know, and act their, their lungs out. And of course, even the crew, eh? the crew usually, these crew guys are not easy. You cannot work with them if they don't have anything in their pocket or if they haven't left uh, a bunch of bananas at home for the family to feed. So budget is a really no, a big knocker for most filmmakers here and in Africa. Also, uh, another challenge I found uh, when, when shooting Tembele was the weather, even the travel. Because you know all that, we're talking money, if you're going to shoot, that's why people choose to shoot in, in small spaces, close to proximity. But you know with film, you have to go all the way. How, why? Because you, you, you're making a creation for the entire globe to, to watch. If you cannot go and shoot beyond or break boundaries, then I don't know what kind of film you're going to tell. So we had a problem because uh, I shot Tembele in, um, uh, in Waise, uh, after then I shot it, I shot it in the, in the, in the noisy streets of Kampala. Uh, then I shot a bit of it in the, in the garbage center, which is also tricky. And from all those places where you go to, you're supposed to pay licenses. Yeah, so, so um, the authorities have to make it easy for you, but there's nothing like easy, easy, easy here in Uganda or in Africa. People always want you to pay. So I had to move to Bali and move to Kapchora as well and climb those hills to sh get proper shots. And we had to wake up at about 4.30 a.m. because we were not sure, we are not residents of Kapchora. And because it's mountainous, we wanted to catch the morning, the early riser, the morning, the morning sun popping out from its bed. And I'll tell you that we waited for over three hours and we did not get the proper sun. But however, it gave us a different outlook give us a different perspective because of the hills, the beautiful hills and, and plush green. Uh, yeah, if we, there's that scene that when Tembele is moving from hill to hill, going back home for a barrio scene. So I'm still glad even if we have those challenges that we managed to actually bath a baby, a very beautiful baby Tembele. And I'm so glad that it's making marks and still, you know, hitting the airwaves. One of the reasons why it's very important to have clear communication from the director to the entire crew and production team. One, you have to be straight up. Take for example, if you're speaking to your crew, they must understand what time it is that you're going to call a shot. Okay? What time are you rolling? You don't say call time. The call sheet says call time is 4 a.m. Then you come at 6.30 a.m. It doesn't make sense, it just doesn't make sense. You'll be taking the entire production, you know, crew and team or the entire production backwards. So it's important that we, we understand each other on the matter of time. Then also, it's also very important to let the people know 
that I know it's not the role of the director, that today we're just going to eat portion and beans. So that everyone knows what we're going to eat. You get it? Not someone coming and expecting chicken or sausages at lunchtime. Of course, that's because of budget. You get it? So also, uh, it's also important to have a, a relationship. Relationship comes with communication, of course. So if someone has a problem, it's best they let you know. Or they call you up and let you know earlier. So much so that if you have to make a few changes here and there, or switch up on a crew or a, or a, or a camera guy or a camera operator, so that you do it on time so that your production doesn't lag behind. When it comes to choice of a uh, director of photography or a DOP, or even a camera operator, the onus is on the director to do that. But in cases where you are just, you've been hired to be a, a, a director, I'm sure your powers are less. But in situations where you have to choose, these are the reasons why you should choose a proper DOP. One, you must choose a sane or a healthy director of photography. Why? Because this guy's mind has to work 360, 360 nonstop, because this is the guy picking up on all the action on set. So imagine a scenario where you pick a guy who is high or a guy who, who has a problem with his eyes. So you definitely have all these images either out of focus or blurred, or you have, you have to scream at the DOP all the time to you know, do his job. But the advantage is that if you get to choose your DOP, then you definitely know that this guy has experience, you've seen his works, he has traversed lands, and you know he has done a couple of uh, productions. And of course you have a way, a way with him. You just you know, raise your, your finger or thumb, then you already knows what you mean. As a director, it's usually one of the most cumbersome experiences, working with crowd scenes, especially. If a scene requires that you use numbers, uh, usually these numbers are not like professional actors. So it's very, very important that you, have, you know what tone to use on those numbers. <laughs> like I've had uh, experiences uh, when I shot on uh, Behind the Window Market, where, where, we, where I was shooting almost over 100 people who were moving back and forth. Like in situations, sometimes I'll give you techniques or teach bits. As a director, I plant cameras, then plant my character to maneuver through those, you know. But in cases where you have power over those numbers, you get the point. It's, it's usually important that you have a way with your, your assistant or your AD, your assistant director, and you talk about these things. Either the, your, your, your protagonist is moving towards you or just moving uh, through the numbers or moving with the populace. Then you also make sure that your camera operators or your DOPs know where they've mounted their cameras, either on high streets or at the extreme end of the streets, and make sure that they're actually using the right lenses, you know, to, to make sure that your, your lead character is in check. When it comes to the, the issue of casting, you know casting is one of the most integral parts of, of a film. Casting is a situation where you have to pick up on the right actor or right body to move the message of the film ahead. It's usually tricky in cases where you, you but if you go to places like Hollywood, they usually have understudies, like you have one, one lead character, then they have maybe a stunt, you've seen it in action movies, we have like a stunt, and actually if you Google, you can actually check out that a Sylvester Stallone has almost a lookalike. <laughs> Uh, Denzel almost has almost like a look at like dark, same body mass and all. So much so that if there comes in a need, for, or an urgent need for stunts or rolling in the mud and you can't pull it off, they definitely turn to the double. You get the point. So uh, usually when I'm casting in my films, because I usually participate in the writing process, from the word go, I already have a face or a kind of body that I want to actually play that role. 
it is rare that I start off thinking of a lead character or a support character or an integral actor in a film when I don't know that person or I have no, you know, figment of imagination of how the character will look like. But now, usually the challenges come in when you have like two good people like you had cited. If you have like two actors, one is probably good with audibility, one is in touch with his emotions because the actors who are not really so in touch with their emotions. And if, for example, you're shooting up an emotional film and you know that film is almost 60% emotions, it's emotional driven, then definitely you'll have to jump for that character who will actually bring or drive the story home. Take, for example, in Tembele, I cast uh, Patrick Kakalukani. I had no doubt that he would play that role very well. And because he's a round character, yeah, he definitely pulled it off because he was in touch with his emotions. Then he knew how to move his body. His body language was on point. He knew how to relate with his wife, Mawe, and you know, so on and so forth. So basically, it can never be too hard unless when you can't pinpoint the, the, the character that you're looking for, which is almost hard. You get the point? Because this universe has so many actors. Yeah. So you just have to go for that right person. Then there are cases where you look for a person who has 70% of what you need. It is up to you, the director, to sit with this character and give them a few weeks of tutoring, two weeks of coaching. You can even hire an acting coach to polish the edges or take off the rough edges and make this character perfect for the film. If you're a director and you want to, you know, have the best picture, one, you must have a working relationship or a perfect relationship with your DOP. Because remember, as a director, you're not the one handling the camera. So if you're one with your DOP, then I, I'm sure that's a very first step to giving birth to a very nice picture. Then I'll give you my experience. Um, one, what camera do you want to fly with? Do you want to fly with an Asa Mini Pro? Do you want to fly a Red? Do you want to fly an Ari? It's, it's totally up to you because all this, this conversation must have it with your DOP. At most, you have to talk to your editor as well. Because remember, the good picture doesn't start with the director only. It is a process again. Then don't forget to always shake the hand of your location manager or your location, your location scout. All these people come in handy to have a good picture. Also, I'll tell you, don't lose faith in your costumer or your makeup artist because there's what they call the color palette in film. The color palette, uh, we'll talk about the location or the ambience. Do you want like a heated area like Karamoja? Or I'll give an example of a desert. Or are you looking at greenery like uh, Queen Elizabeth? Or you're looking in the West? So all these things will help you, will influence what your character is going to be dressed like, what kind of makeup your character will wear, or what kind of, of picture your, your, your DOP is going to shoot. Are they shooting a flat? Are they using templates? What are they going to do? What kind of software is your editor going to use? Because all those things merge as one to bring out a proper picture. But most of all, I advise any director to make sure that you squeeze your film into at least a micro storyboard. A storyboard is like a chronological flow of what your film will look like, but in small um, illustrations or, 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 you know, scribbled pen, you know, impressions to give you that would be impression of what your film will look like on camera and at the end of coloring. As a filmmaker, as a director, producer, actor, um, this is what I usually tell myself. And these are some of the prayers I usually say off my fingertips to make sure that I stay on top of my game 
and to make sure that I still make relevant films that actually make sense and entertain the audience. One, I make sure I stay sober, especially in my line of work. Like when you stay sober, like you always have your mind, you know, together. Because the worst thing I would wish for any creative or any writer is to lose their mind in the midst of a project. You know that would be disaster. Then also, I do a lot of travels. I usually move to serene places. I can go and check into uh, a small, you know, place up country where there is peace and all you hear is just the ambience and, you know, friendly environment that actually helps me, uh, you know, tickle my mind, especially if I'm writing and creating images. Then also, I try to create a peaceful environment around myself. And also, mostly, I try to stay healthy, uh, not forgetting, looking at other people's works, people that have, have been there before me, and people who have produced good works. I usually watch a lot of these films uh, to make sure that I also stay in line and see what others have done. So I usually pick off a few lessons here and there to actually uh, keep me relevant and make me uh, a good filmmaker. My advice to all upcoming filmmakers, uh, young guys who want to venture into film is just stay, stay focused. Uh, don't let the ways of the world take you off your path. Uh, open your eyes and open them wider and tell stories from your home. Don't tell stories that you don't have no clue about. That's the best way I usually tell people. Uh, set your mark in telling stories from your home because no one can tell them better than you. Then lastly, keep shooting those films. Don't let a project lag on a PC or in a book or in scribbles. Just go out there and shoot, 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 shoot. Someday, someone will watch your film and say, there you are, I wanna work with you. So all the best and keep them rolling. I usually spend my time writing scripts, uh, doing research. Uh, for example, I'm, I'm very, I'm moved by cinemas that have grown like Bollywood and Nollywood, not forgetting Hollywood that is the king. So I usually draw my inspiration from places like that. And yeah, I'm Ugandan. My journey as a, as a film director uh, dates way back uh, from home. I am born of a father who is a photographer and uh, I used to tag on his back each time he went to do his events. That of course I was about uh, 13 years. That's when I started to step out to follow him and see. So all that time that kind of gave me inspiration. While other kids uh, were playing with uh, motor cars, I was playing with ancient cameras like the Olympus, the Konikas and the Ashikas. So basically all that time I had to learn, like, you know, slowly by slowly, because I grew up in a home that had a photographer in it. So, of course, slowly by slowly, I went, did my education in primary, then um, did my education in secondary. And of course, you know, when you're still a teenager, there's not so much that, that you can, you know, lay your hands on apart from, you know, um, waiting to grow up. And when I went to university, I did, uh, I pursued a diploma in music, dance and drama, that's performing arts, which entirely talks, teaches drama, stage management, writing plays, and of course, reading uh, classical literature. So after the diploma, I did not really have that vision much, but I still had uh, spent time on stage. Take for example, I was an actor on um, Bat Valley Theater. I acted with the likes of uh, uh, Katolu Wama, the late, Ashraf Semogere, the Vanunjis, so, from there, I took time to learn and accept that this was the craft that, you know, God had called me to do. So after the diploma, I noticed that that really wasn't enough for me. So I went and pursued a bachelor's in arts in arts where I majored English literature and uh, 
I majored uh, mass communication and um, cinematography. So I majored African cinema. So I popped out and also did the diploma in radio and TV production. But as I did that, I was also sidelining on the side, I had side hustles where I was a model of Sleeve Your Worry, as the face of Sleeve Your Worry in fashion for a while, for about five years. Then that's when the opportunity for Big Brother Kenyan, the Big Brother Africa as the third representative for Uganda in South Africa uh, under Endemo. So after that time, the world started to open up for me. So I noticed that when you grow, you have to learn a few things here and there. It's the movements that you make or it's the sure steps that you take that you get to learn certain things and from certain people who are greater than you. So starting to make film, remember I pursued arts for almost six years. So I was already, I'd already had some experience with writing. And after I'd done theater, I said, why not? Why don't I start? Um, writing my own plays or my own scripts, slowly by slowly, I started to take it on. But all that time I had my, in, I was in touch with the National Theatre where all the art, artisans usually gather. Um, and also I had already an agency called More Ideas. More Ideas was an advertising, started off as an advertising agency where I used to, to do copywriting. I used to write a lot of, you know, short commercials or TVCs, which I actually do up to now. So uh, with film, I started off slowly by slowly as the industry also was taking, you know, you know, baby steps. So it took me a while to figure out whether I should embark entirely in film or stay back and do what I have to do. And I must say that uh, I'm proud of myself. It didn't really start off so hard because I already had an experience of acting through uh, performing arts as music and dance and drama. Then I also had experience uh, in writing and directing as well. So that came off like a combo to my advantage. So my first film that I wrote was a project called Chemutai in the morning. Chemutai is a story about female genital mutilation, but I was unlucky. I didn't have funds to produce a film like that. So I took more time to make more money so I can jump into the field of film. Of course, with money, you know, naturally, you can't say you're a filmmaker or a producer when you don't have budget. So my first success was a film called Stain. Stain was a film shot in, um, around the banks of Lake Katwe in Kasese. It's a story about human rights and, and domestic violence. Uh, it, it really made marks for me and it actually firm, made me firm founded, especially when it came to film. Then I wasn't sure, but after that film won, uh, got 13 nominations in the uh, Uganda Film Festival. Then also it uh, actually um, uh, went on and won uh, Best Actress or Best Performance in the Africa Movie Academy Awards after a period of 10 years. It won that award, that's around two years ago. So we we're glad that gave me a lot of confidence to actually realize that, oh, maybe I'm made for this field. I'm meant for it. So my next uh, winner was a project called Tembele. Tembele is a film about a young man who is very ex expectant and celebrant of the fact that his wife is expecting a son, a baby boy, and this guy works on a garbage truck. So um, um, uh, the devil hits the roof and the child passes on. So it, he, he fails to actually acknowledge the fact that he has lost. And indeed, surely people str do struggle with loss. Most people struggle to, you know, keep up with loss. So this guy goes mad, like he runs mad because he fails to admit to the fact that he has lost a child. So this film has actually made runs for me. It has, it, was one the, it has won the best feature film in Uganda Film Festival. It has won best cinematography in Africa Movie Academy Award, which is the Oscars of Africa. Then it's the very first Ugandan film to take a leap into the Oscars, the Academy of Oscars, which you all know. And it's the very first film in Uganda to actually make that mark. Then it has also gone on and won uh, official selection in the Voodoo Afrique in Canada. It is also recently, it, it, is also, it also has an official selection in Afrif. So um, I'm glad to say that, yeah, we've come a long way and we are, we're actually still on the move as long as we have short steps.